the, the wonderful thing normally being the last on any panel is quite a curse. And there are two reasons for that. The first is that you have to sort of find a way to be interesting against the backdrop of everything that's been said already. And the second is that wonderful adage that everything has already been said, but it hasn't yet been said by everybody. So you feel compelled <laughs> to say things that have already been said in different ways. And the wonderful thing, and I'm going to probably Bella, but I, whoever came up with the construct of this panel has relieved all of us, I think, of that particular challenge. And I think that's been a tremendous achievement. If you think about what we've had, um, we had Norbert Kuhl in the first place setting a context, an historical context and a context in respect of issues that we have to address in the future. And then we had Thomas speaking on the misuse, the distortion of supposedly scientific research insights and perspectives in order to frustrate our ability to be able to address the challenges of the future. Now, that's a wonderful backdrop um, for the, I think, very modest little contribution that I'm going to try and make, because I want to try and weave this together into the context of policy. Why does science not translate into better outcomes through the lens of policy? Why do we face much stress in policy environments? We're seeing as much fracture as we're seeing both in efforts at collective action at the level of the global commons and even collective action at the level of nation states. And these fractures are apparent everywhere for reasons that I'll sketch in just a moment. So why is that? And that perhaps, uh, I'm not trying to do Ferry's job for him, but that perhaps is what we might discuss among ourselves ex post. Because unless we solve that problem, science, research, technology will not solve anything. As Norbert very correctly said, they are means to ends. It is the purpose to which we put them that matters. And the fact that they enable solutions that we could not have imagined 10 years ago, or 30 years ago, or 50 years ago, is no solution if we cannot find ways of collectively employing them, based firstly on individual excellence, and secondly, the ability to translate that into collective action at appropriate scales. So let me start with something that Ferenc said right at the beginning, and I'm going to take a non-Hungarian reference point, but simply to illustrate that this thought is widespread. When Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci, was in prison in 1930, there are some extraordinary prison diaries which are really worthwhile at least glancing through. I'm not, I wouldn't recommend that one read everything in them. But he made the interesting observation, quite a lyrical one. He said, the past is not yet dead, the new is not yet born, and in the interregnum, awful monsters appear. And if any of you recognize elements of that in the present, then don't be too surprised. I'm going to give you one other quote around that particular topic before I get on to the slides. But this comes from 1919. So Gramsci, you can argue, is in the midst of the interwar period, in the context of the rise of national socialism and fascism, and is reflecting that sense of a transformative era. What I'm now going to quote for you is from W.B. Yeats, William Butler Yeats, in 1919, in the immediate aftermath of the First World War. And he's not being prophetic, although he would have thought in his particular millennial sense that he was. He's actually just reflecting the angst of the privileged classes of Europe in the immediate aftermath of the First World War. And the first stanza of this poem, called The Second Coming, is very evocative, at least for me. It reads, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, 
the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the earth. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. And then the last two lines of the first stanza explain why. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Now, if you find again echoes of that in the present, it wouldn't be surprising. But the obligation on us in the context of a third blue sky conference is to prevent mere anarchy being loosed upon the earth and the blood dim tide becoming more powerful. So let's have a look at it, because if we understand the problem, perhaps we can do something about it. It's a wonderful age in many ways. Aikido, we have all of the elements necessary for that. Look at the level of air connectivity. Forget the carbon emissions for a moment and just think about the level of connectivity that potentially enables collective action. Look at the level of internet connectivity. So in both the real and the virtual worlds, albeit that there is a tension between them and a paradox undoubtedly in that reality, the level of connectivity is completely unprecedented. That has implications, as Dan Brooks will tell you in a couple of days, uh, or tomorrow, I think, uh, in respect to the spread of pathogens, but that's a different problem for the moment. <clears throat> then we have what is happening as a result of this gigantic shift of the center of economic gravity and the aspiration of the Chinese to be able to reach out into their hinterland and beyond through this remarkable Belt and Road Initiative. 172 countries are impacted by that extraordinary initiative. Connectivity once again. And then, amazingly, as a result of the effects of greenhouse gas emissions and the melting of the Arctic ice cap, we are enhancing shipping connectivity around the Arctic as a consequence as well. So if you look at it through one lens, the opportunities in respect of Aikido are wholly remarkable. Would it be thus? So the first thing that we have to think about if we're going to develop a perspective that allows us to apply that sense of collective purpose premised on an assumption of collective benefit if we get it right and wholesale disaster if we get it wrong is to try to think about how we might reformulate concepts that would enable us to address these challenges on a global scale. And I'm suggesting not for purposes of deep analysis right now, but this happens to be where we've got to in terms of our thinking on this, we have to firstly reconfigure the Grobrundtland-derived Venn diagram that Norbert showed you earlier. We have to make economic growth such as it is, and I'm not convinced it has to be increased appreciably in aggregate, but we have to make it in the way that Thomas was describing both environmentally and socially sustainable. The reason, by the way, why those multiples of financial assets relative to real assets haven't worsened is because of rising inequality, which as a consequence of unconventional monetary policy and the like since 2008, has in fact confined the ability to be able to leverage financial assets to a smaller class of people. Otherwise, it would have got appreciably worse. The second, and this comes back to Ursula Brenner's uh, great effort in this regard, and by the way, the women who got the Nobel for getting anti-personnel mines banned were also women. <laughs> Men never seem to be part of collectives that find solutions to problems in social spaces. But we have to rethink poverty and inequality 
through a lens of equity. It's not that inequality is an odd phenomenon. Distributions, whether they be Gaussian or whether they be fat-tailed, are a normal phenomenon of most applications. But the critical issue becomes, is that distribution the product of social outcomes which are intrinsically inequitable? If so, they require to be addressed profoundly. The third is we have to start thinking about security in completely different ways. It's actually mad in this highly connected world to ring fence national security on an individual level and then allocate a fixed percentage of budgetary spend and frequently of GDP to the provision for national security while ignoring regional, global, and human security. If security is the reduction of vulnerability and the creation of resilience, we need to develop mindsets that allow us to get our heads around these things in sensible ways and apply resources for that purpose. Now, if we're going to do those three things, then we need new normative frameworks in order to do that. Because our current normative frameworks prioritize the nation state, prioritize the individual, and diminish the capability of collective action at scale in every conceivable circumstance. And only if we get those new normative frames effectively in place will we be able to make our global institutions, and I'm using the word loosely here because it applies in terms of Brussels, as well as New York, uh, and uh, in other words, the United Nations, Bretton Woods Institutions, and the WTO. It's not just at the global scale. We can only fix the challenges of global institutions if we change the normative frameworks, and we can only change the normative frameworks if we change the perspective or the paradigm. So why aren't we doing this? It's not really all that complicated. I mean, I'm sure there's a variety of views on what I've said thus far, but there's nothing particularly outstanding about it. It's common sense on several levels. So why, why can't we do it? Well, the first thing is just the problem of complexity. I'm not going to lecture to you on the nature of complex systems. What does matter is that humanity is a complex system incapable of direction from a single point. Humanity, embedded in a biogeosphere, or an Earth system if you prefer, is a complex adaptive system in which co-evolution, for good or for ill, is a continuous phenomenon. A complex system for the purposes for which I'm speaking now is something characterized by many strongly interdependent variables, significant feedback loops, a propensity to chaotic behavior because of the complexity of the system itself, thus multiple metastable states where temporary equilibria are established but in conditions of instability and a completely non-Gaussian distribution of outputs. Now, if you think about human behavior, if you think about the functioning of humanity, and if you think about our interaction with the biogeosphere, then again, that's fairly obvious. But frankly, that's not how we think about it, not within individual scientific disciplines, and certainly not at policy levels. Why is that? Well, actually, Norbert put it rather well. Human thought is linear. We don't think in conceptual holes. We don't think in the context of complex systems. We don't plan in that way. Western education since the Renaissance has been premised on academic specialization. Academic specialization gets in the way of being able to appreciate adequately the complexity of the environment that we have to address. I'm going to stay in the social sciences for just one second, but you can do exactly the, thing in the same thing in respect to the natural sciences. Let me take the social sciences, though. When you discuss something through the realm of political science, or the realm of economics, or the realm of law, 
or the realm of sociology. You're describing the same complex reality from a different intellectual starting point. It's simply a paradigmatic frame visualizing a facet of the same complex reality. Now let's not get into what happens when you start thinking in the context of evolutionary biology or cognitive neuroscience in respect to the same issues, even if you are addressing the same issues. The jargon becomes incomprehensible. The ability of people to engage in meaningful debate around these issues creates the sort of distortive effects, misinterpretation of data, misinterpretation of paradigms, misinterpretation of scientific, in quotes, hypotheses, that then confuse the living daylights out of policymakers. And the reason for that is that interconnectivity exponentially increases uncertainty. The higher the level of connectivity, the more difficult it is to come up with a policy that is responsive to that highly interconnected and hence dynamic with a propensity towards chaotic outcomes and a non-Gaussian distribution of outcomes. It becomes more difficult in policy terms to be able to address those issues. The algebra doesn't matter. It's very simple anyway. So how do we cope? We cope on the basis of heuristics. What's in heuristic? It's a learned behavior. It's something that we've done before. So when any of us walks into a room like this, and finds a laptop over there and a screen over there with a projector next to it and you see some microphones lying around and a group of people sitting in chairs. You know what you're supposed to do. You don't have to sort of size it up, calculate carefully. You've been in this sort of situation a thousand times before and you know what you're supposed to do, broadly speaking, is say something sensible and amuse the audience. And that's how policymakers behave all the time. They apply learned rules of prior behaviors. They walk into situations that are largely unfamiliar, but which contain enough familiar elements to allow them to adapt. And they adapt. What do they do? They do what they know how to do. Do they comprehend, grasp, analyze, and get a grip on the current reality in a significant way? Of course not. It comes back to Norbert's time paradox. It takes so long to learn, and the rate of decay in terms of obsolescence of new knowledge is astronomically high. So for the policymaker who's not a specialist in any discipline, this is a nightmare. Making do until the next election is the best you can. Have a look, and I'm not being disrespectful of the woman, I think she's displayed phenomenal courage. But have a look at Theresa May's management of the Brexit discussion. Right? She's just making do. She hasn't got a clue where she wants to end up. She's just trying to survive. Right? Michelle Barnier is not doing anything else, by the way. Nor is Mr. Juncker. I mean, you can keep on going. But the, it's a classic illustration of the nature of the problem. So what do we know? Well, there are a couple of things we think we can know. Broadly speaking, population is around about 7.7 .7 billion at present. It was around about 7.5 about 18 months ago. It's heading for something like 9.3 to 9.7, pick your range, by 2050. There's accelerating urbanization, 90% of which is taking place in Africa and Asia, not in Europe and the United States. There's aging, which is going to pose challenges in respect of four generations potentially seeking economic return for something resembling work at the same time for the first time in history. And we have these remarkable transformative technologies which run across a space which is not only info and bio and nano, but increasingly neuro and cogno which are completely transforming everything that we understand about epistemology and even human ontology. So, what is really happening? The first thing is we have this geoeconomic trend that is causing chaos on a geopolitical level. 
the United States and Europe as units of economic output are declining in relative terms. China, India, and certain elements of Asia are rising. The center of gravity, as we've heard, has shifted from the Atlantic to the Pacific. This is a secular trend. It's not going to go away. It's going to be something which, short of a larger catastrophe, will be with us for the next 20 odd years. But right now, you can see on multiple levels great unease about that particular experience, particularly on the part of the United States. And I would simply refer to the so-called Thucydides trap, which those of you who know your Greek history will know was about the rise of Sparta relative to Athens, and hence the tension that arose within the Attic world at that point in time. The second is in a completely different realm. For the last 30 years, We've seen increasing returns to capital and declining returns to labor in terms of distribution of economic assets in the production functions and the consumption functions. As a result of that, we've seen widening inequality in society. As a result of that, we've seen tensions and pressures arising on multiple levels. And that problem is going to be further exacerbated very sharply over the next 20 or 30 years by these disruptive congruent technologies. Because the only people who are going to be in a position to derive significant benefits from that are going to be persons who have ownership of the technologies and persons who are young, smart, and educated enough to be able to capitalize on the opportunities that they present. Huge masses of people are going to be stranded as a result of the transformation that this is going to bring about. And if you have any doubt about that, just look at the history between 1780 and 1860, which is the first industrial revolution, and have a look at the level of social and political disruption that that occasioned across the European landscape. One of the consequences of that interface is that we're going to see jobless growth and increasing social dislocation. That necessarily and unsurprisingly is leading to a weakening of representative democracy. First of all, it means that governments can't meet the expectations of their electorates, they can't provide protection, and quite frankly, they can't take credit for surges in economic opportunity because they're largely the product of the global economy, not the national economy. So the relevance of representative democracy has declined. I leave a thought with you, I'm not going to explore it now, but every political system is the product of its age. And the emergence of representative democracy was the product of the late 18th century and the Industrial Revolution in the 19th, which was premised on a shift from sovereignty of the sovereign to sovereignty of the people. Because you couldn't get all the people in the Agora in the same way that you could in Periclea and Athens, not even in the 13 states of the United States after the adoption of the Constitution at Philadelphia, we elected people to represent us. That's not necessarily the best form of government, and it's not necessarily the form that will define the next 50 years. Meanwhile, in the midst of all of this, gaps in the geopolitical landscape have seen the resurgence of geopolitics on a significant scale. We've seen it in terms of ungoverned spaces from the Mediterranean through Central Asia over the course of the last 10 years or so. We've seen it in respect of Russian revanchism and Mr. Putin's desire to control the near abroad, which is creating tensions in Eurasia. And we are seeing it increasingly, and it hasn't really taken off yet, in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, where Russia, China, the Koreas, and Japan all intersect without a regional security arrangement in place. So geopolitics is back on the map, and frankly, we don't have any instruments to deal with it sensibly. And all of those factors together have led to this problem that I guess Dan Brooks is going to be talking about tomorrow, of forced migration. It's not migration. Most people are in favor of migration. You want access to skills in a global economy. There's nothing terribly exciting about that. 
What you probably don't want is 600,000 people arriving tomorrow when you haven't developed any means of being able to accommodate them meaningfully within either economic or social structures. So forced migration, which is the product of rising inequality, falling uh, ability to be able to provide for national citizens, and geopolitical tensions, is patently, obviously, a threat to the entire system. And then we have this remarkable phenomenon of 7.7 .7 billion people pushing up against planetary boundaries on every conceivable level because we are producing more, consuming more, and wasting more than, by definition, humanity has ever done. Always remember, before 1930, there were never 2 billion people on the, present, on the planet. We're now at 7.7. .7, we're pushing out for 2 billion more. Between now and 2050, there are going to be more people going into cities for the first time than existed on the planet before 1930. Are we pushing up against planetary boundaries in an integrated Earth system? Yeah, we're pushing up against planetary boundaries in an integrated Earth system. It doesn't require too much debate. Now, I just want to show you the problem. The problem is these aren't isolated phenomena. That's just the lot of them put together in a diagram. But those two reinforce one another. The revival of geopolitics and migratory flows are quite clearly closely related, and each exacerbates the other. The increasing returns to capital, falling returns to labor, jobless growth, and disruptive new congruent technologies quite obviously reinforce one another. Any one of them drives the others. Migratory flows and the weakening of representative democracy, you can see all over Europe under present circumstances and arguably in the United States as well. And the revival of geopolitics and the impact that that is having on the Earth footprint or the footprint of humanity on global systems is self-evidently uh, highly related. You can argue that climate refugees will produce circumstances in which we will see significantly greater migratory flows. The whole of this is a system. All elements affect all other parts of it. And that's the challenge. Now think about how difficult it is to come up with a policy, if you're a policymaker, to address the whole that one's dealing with in respect of all of that. So when you look at it analytically, the new congruent technologies and the fact that we're pushing up against global Earth system boundaries in the context of the revival of geopolitics is quite naturally producing a weakening of representative democracy, jobless growth, enhanced migratory flows, increasing returns to capital, falling returns to labor. And that's the problem. Unless you understand the whole, you can't actually deal with any significant part of it in any fashion. Now, the fundamental problem, I'm not going to belabor this because I've said most elements of it already, but policymakers deal with fragments of this reality all the time. They don't deal with the whole. They can't deal with the whole. They don't have the resources to deal with the whole. They don't have people in their immediate vicinity who comprehend the whole, and can advise them in a comprehensive fashion. And because of this time paradox, they haven't got time to learn about it in order to adopt policies which are going to satisfy citizens who increasingly, as a context of social media, have become expecting of instant gratification. If I crowdsource ideas for the solution of a problem, I will get 15,000 ideas immediately. I could possibly even crowdsource the funding to implement them. That's simply not how political systems work. So translating expectations of millennial and younger generations into policies that actually address the complexity of these particular challenges is a bit of a nightmare. And one of the consequences that we have to grapple with here is that we have become hubristic. 
hubris in terms of ancient Greek concepts leads to nemesis. And we have been hubristic. We have imagined that we could create a highly connected global economy with global financial institutions, global value chains, the levels of connectivity that I showed you in respect of air travel and internet traffic, and that we could then manage it somehow without even beginning to understand what the implications of that were. The easiest way to think about this dimension is to take Tom Friedman's silly metaphor of the global village. Any of you who know anything about villages know that in a village, the economy and the society are commensurate. Right? The economy works for the benefit of the society on the scale of the village. It's perfectly obvious. The polity, whatever form it takes, only has to intervene at the margins to avoid a certain degree of conflict within the village. There's no particular problem about that. But on the global scale today, and I'd argue even on the European scale today, the economy is highly integrated, but the society is completely fractured. So the polity is having to intervene continuously in order to be able to address challenges and frankly doesn't have instruments that are effective or appropriate in respect of dealing with those challenges. So I hope we'll be able to say more about the solutions to this. I'm not optimistic that there are silver bullets. I'm not even optimistic that there are three things that we need to do but we can tease that out uh, in the discussions themselves. And circularity in respect of economic activity is quite clearly a significant dimension of all of that. But meanwhile, if one's realistic about it, the only way to mitigate and manage risk in conditions of extreme uncertainty such as those that we're following is firstly to invest in foresight and insight, which means you have to know as much as possible despite the time paradox. And it doesn't matter whether you're a concerned citizen, a specialist in a particular area, or a policymaker. You have to do your best to wrap your head around it. And you have to try and apply that knowledge to mitigate and manage the risks that you assume. And then you have to build in as much resilience as you possibly can against shocks because turbulence and uncertainty are endemic in the situation that we face under present circumstances. Now, the only truly resilient entities are actually organic entities. No building is resilient against unlimited shock. Humans are actually quite good. You can hit me, knock me down three times. The odds are I'll get up. I'll almost certainly survive a fall from two stories, possibly three. I may break a few bones in the process, and I'll certainly hurt for a few days, but I'll probably survive. Humans are actually quite resilient. Organic systems are quite resilient. That's why we have evolutionary biology. We're interested in seeing how, in evolutionary terms, adaptation takes place, and hence species become more resilient under predictable boundary conditions. So the challenge in terms of developing social institutions and political institutions that are responsive to the conditions of uncertainty that we face today is know as much as we can and engineer as far as possible for organic resilience. Thanks very much.